My name is Glenn Kinkin. I'm the senior minister here at Centenary United Methodist Church in Winston-Salem, North Carolina. And I'm so pleased that you've chosen to join us for worship this morning via live stream. During the next hour, you'll experience the risen Christ through word, prayer, song, and maybe even through the silence of the moment. We pray and hope that during this time that you will be drawn closer to Christ as we are joining you via here in the sanctuary. We also hope that you'll explore us a little bit on the internet to find out more about our church, but in doing so, you'll find that we're a warm congregation full of friendly folks who hope to learn, serve, and grow together as we build the kingdom of God here in Winston-Salem and around the world. Thank you for being with us. We hope you enjoy. Good morning. Welcome to Centenary United Methodist Church. And more importantly, welcome to a gathering where we will worship, where we will take time to release the things that may be occupying our mind and holding our hearts captive, where we will allow God's spirit to move and hopefully touch our lives in a new and transforming way on this day. If you're visiting with us today, in fact, I invite all of you rather, to uh, please find the fellowship folders in each aisle or each pew. Um, they're located on the aisle, and if you would please fill those out, we would love for you to register your attendance. If you are visiting with us today and you have not given us your personal contact information, would like more information about what is happening here at Centenary, ways that you can engage uh, within our community, not just inside Centenary, but outside in ministry and mission, 
please share that information with us. We'd love to be able to share with you the opportunities that exist. And if you're joining us by live stream, we welcome you as well and ask that you would please scroll to the bottom of your screen and also register your attendance. There is a note there, a box rather, where if you have any questions you'd like to share with us, please give us that information and we will indeed respond. You'll notice in your bulletin that we have a flyer this week that's advertising a pretty exciting event in two weeks. We will not be gathering here to worship. We'll be at Tanglewood under shelter number four. It begins at 1030, worship at 11. Afterwards, we will share lunch together. Uh, on the back of it is not we're just going to be joining to celebrate and worship on World Communion Sunday. We're going to be taking the opportunity to respond in a way that will spread the ministries and mission of Centenary around the world. We're gonna partner with UMCOR in providing and putting together completed hygiene kits that will go to people across the southern border as well as those uh, in areas where there's been natural disaster and it will provide for them some of the basic necessities for cleaning and personal care. There's a list that is neat that is needed of the items that are needed rather that's on this flyer. We're looking for completed kits. If you would like more information, I invite you to go to the happening email that went out this past week. If you did not get a chance to look at the video that's in it, I encourage you to do so. I think that you will find it to be both funny as well as informative. With that in mind, let us center our hearts and minds upon the wonder of God's love for us as we come together as the body of Christ to worship together. Uku tula Uku tula Please stand and join me as we call ourselves into worship. Cry out to the Lord, for God hears our pleas. May our hearts be springs of water and our eyes fountains of tears, for God answers the cries of the suffering. Put your faith in God, our great physician. He will reach out um, of Gilead for God soothes the sorrow of the faithful. Call upon the Lord, for God hears our pleas. We enter God's gates with hope and gladness. Come, worship the one who hears our pleas.
let us affirm our faith together. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God, amen. Please be seated. Let us take a moment in silence to center ourselves as we pray together. Gracious and merciful God, as we try to still our hearts and minds, and as we are able to, we soon realize out of the silence we notice and hear things that we otherwise would have not seen, heard, or noticed. Lord, I pray that in the midst of our busy lives, which sometimes are filled from sunup to sundown and beyond, that we would find time, we would be intentional to make time to be aware, to be attentive, to be intentional about being still in the midst of the busyness. Lord, I realize that sounds funny, but yet I think about the way your son, our savior lived the intentionality that he took in the midst of his busy ministry in life to break away, to find time alone, to listen, to hear, to respond. Father, so often I wonder if we feel like our lives are disconnected, but in truth, everything in life is connected, even if we do not see it and are not aware of it. The truth is our actions, our decisions, our choices, even our inactions affect those around us as well as the actions and choices and even inaction of others affect us. This connection sometimes is troubling. We don't like to admit it. Sometimes it's irritating. We wish it wasn't true. But yet we live in a world that consists of people who are not always on the same page. Yes, they are like us, they are your children, but their lives are lived differently with different priorities. And Lord, I don't know about if I can speak for anybody here, but for me, sometimes that, it, it, it kind of ticks me off. And I need to remember that I'm not the only one on the planet. Lord, I pray that that would be true for all of us. And, and the key to understanding that is to go to you, to be still and to pray, to trust and to learn, to learn how to live our lives and act as if all that was within, within them is dependent upon you. And then learn to pray as if all within our lives is dependent upon us and our trust and belief in prayer. 
Lord, we ask that you would give us grace, you would give us mercy, you would send your truth and your love to surround and hold us, that we would be vessels, vessels of light and love to those around us because we have grounded our lives in you. And now with the confidence of God's people, we pray the prayer that our Lord has taught us to pray saying, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. This time I'd like to invite our children, ages kindergarten through third grade to come forward and meet Reverend Kate May at the altar, altar rail rather, and that they would come and go out to Children's Church. And while they're doing that, I invite you to stand and turn to page 496 for our hymn, Sweet Hour of Prayer.
A reading from the first letter to Timothy, chapter 2, verses 1 through 7. I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God, our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and to come to know a knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and mankind, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all people. This has now been witnessed to at the proper time. And for this purpose, I was appointed a herald and an apostle. I am telling the truth, I am not lying and a true and faithful teacher of the Gentiles. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Would you pray with me? Almighty and gracious God, as we are gathered here to hear your word read and proclaimed, I humbly pray that you speak to our hearts, speak to our souls in words that are so clear that we would know just what we are to do, who we are to be, so that when we leave this place, that we are doers of your word not just merely hearers of your word. In your son's holy name we pray, amen. So call it an occupational hazard or just my greatest opportunity, but I go to a lot of events and I get to pray at all of them. Now this started when I should have known this was gonna happen. When, when I was in college and I announced to my fraternity brothers one day in October that I had gotten into seminary and that I was going to be a minister and so I had sort of my future mapped out while the rest of them were still putting together resumes. Immediately from that moment on, I got to say grace every night at the fraternity house. Not that my prayers made Meg Kimmel's chicken that much better or that amorphous meal of noodles and butter and bacon and Italian dressing was that much healthier for us. My prayers just became something I got to do. I go to meetings and I get to pray. I go to fundraisers, I get to pray. I pray over golf tournaments. Even when I coached a soccer team in Thomasville, North Carolina at the high school as an assistant coach, the head coach looked at me and said, you get to pray for us before every game. And I thought, what a whole church and state thing gone. I don't mind doing it, don't get me wrong. It's a lot of fun, but even in one of those occasions where I was praying, we got done, someone looked at me and said, wow, it's like you've done this before. I think we've done it once or twice in our lives, and especially for ministers. But when we pray, we think about why do we pray? I mean, we know why we pray before meals. We give thanks for the bounty that God has given to us. Maybe when we pray for meetings, we're asking for God's wisdom or God's guidance. Maybe we pray because we just think we're supposed to. I think we pray because we think it makes a difference. Whatever it is that we're praying before, we think that if we invoke God's presence, God's spirit, God's focus on that assembly, that it will make a difference. You see, when we pray, We're doing something very specific. It's a very specific act of hope, of faith, acknowledging God's power in the world around us. When we pray, it's a very specific ritual that we do, is it not? So we have Paul, he's writing his letter to Timothy, a young minister that he's mentored. And so Paul is writing him, again, sort of in the role of this father of faith, this wise elder, this mentor to his protege. He's instructing Timothy how he as a young minister should lead the church he's been charged with. 
It's a letter that every young ord man should pull off and read several times as they go into their new church to think about this. But what I love in the section that we read today that Camille shared with us is that Paul is telling Timothy to pray for all people, but especially for the rulers and the authorities of the land, to pray for godliness and for God, the gospel message. This belief that Christ is our mediator and hears all of our prayers and answers them according to God's will, that our prayers can make the world a better place. But he's not just writing to Timothy, is he? He's really writing to us. No matter what our profession, no matter what our stage in life, he's writing to us, encouraging us to pray, to encouraging us to pray for a better world. And for that to happen, we too can heed Paul's words to pray for our leaders, to pray for the world in which we live, for our society, and to pray for all of God's children to come into relationship with Christ. For us to make the world a better place, that we're to pray for our leaders, to pray for the society, and to pray that people come into a relationship with Christ. I mean, it's what Paul is telling us to do this morning. Laura Leffler tells a story that back a few years ago, she was at the early morning service, the 8.45, 8, 9 o'clock service, whatever time it was, the early service at St. John's Episcopal Church in Washington, D.C. And she's there, and she's uh, in worship, and she's flipping through the bulletin. She hears the guy behind her flipping through the bulletin and sort of muttering under his breath, sort of chuckling a little bit, and they get to the passing of the peace. And in the passing of the peace, she has that star-struck moment. She greets the people in front of her, the peace of Christ with you. It's so good to see you this morning. And she turns to the person behind her, and lo and behold, she is staring President George W. Bush right in the face. The peace of Christ with you, she says. He says it back to her, and just before they go to communion, because they pass the peace and then went down the aisle for communion, she said, Mr. President, I want you to know that I pray for you every day. And he smiled warmly and he said, thank you so much. That is such a special gift that you give me. Thank you so much. You see, he spoke the truth because to be prayed for is a special gift. But I think it's vitally important to be praying for the leaders around us, for leaders in all aspects of our lives. I mean, we know that organizations, businesses, governments, countries, they all take their direction from the person at the top. Those leaders bear a tremendous burden of responsibility to set the tone, the vision, the culture of whatever unit they are leading. And so if we come in this room thinking and knowing in our heart that prayer has power, imagine the power we yield, the power we ask to be poured upon our leaders, the difference and the impact we make in their lives when we pray for them, when we pray for our parents, for our spouses, for our business partners, for our bosses for the CEOs of the companies with whom we work, for our government leaders, for the leaders of our church. Think about the power that we yield and that we bring upon all in society when we pray for those leaders, when we pray for their families, for their work, for their health, when we pray for their spirit, for their vision, for their stamina, that they would seek and hear the wisdom of God. See, when we pray that way, it is truly a special gift that we lay at their feet, that we pour upon their heads when we pray for those who lead us. When you open the newspapers in the day, more often than not, it has become the headlines 
have become sort of a greatest hits list of the things that break the heart of God. We look at them page after page, headline after headline, we see the brokenness of the world, the things that break the heart of God, and we may say, surely it doesn't have to be this way. And that's what we need to pray for. See, while our prayer can confront and defeat the ills that face our world, we can pray for real change, we can pray for peace, for healing, for human dignity. We can pray that not only these things happen, but that our actions make a true difference in the world. We can pray that our hearts are listening to where God is calling us to live, to work, and what to do. That's on a macro level, but on a micro level, on a personal level, our prayers make real change and a difference. Think of the people in your lives, in your closest sphere of influence. Think of the people who are broken and are, who are hurting physically, emotionally, relationally, spiritually, mentally. Think of the brokenness and the unease and the illness that's in there. You see, we can make a difference in their lives when we pray for them, when we lift their names up to the heavens and say, God, you are the great physician, only you can heal them. But imagine the impact we make on their lives when we share with them that we are praying for them. There's a group of folks in our church who gather on a monthly basis and they like to knit and they like to pray. And so they knit these prayer shawls. As you see some of these here on the altar rail, this one here in my hand, they pray over these shawls as they knit them. Now they may look a little bit at first like a common blanket like you might throw on the back of the couch to watch TV in and wrap up in, but these are not those. No, these are special because these have been knitted with love, prayed over with fervent prayer. So imagine that person that you're thinking of, if you went to them and told them that you were praying for them, but you also brought them one of these prayer shawls and said, I want you to know you are not alone. I am praying for you. My church is praying for you by proxy. This blanket has special power. This is a prayer shawl, so when you wrap up in it, you are not just putting a blanket on. You are being blanketed in prayers, surrounded by the loving arms of God, because my church believes in the power of prayer. And we believe that prayer can be good for you. You said, see, we have these prayer shawls. Anyone can take it. You don't have to take it for a church member. You can take it for a friend, a neighbor, someone in need. We've got some here on the altar rail today. If you have someone in your life for whom this would be a great benefit to be wrapped in the arms of God and showered in prayer, pick one up at the end of worship. Take it to them. Tell them you are praying for them. Your church is praying for them. If maybe today you don't know of someone, but next week you do, all you have to do is go down to the parlor here on the first floor of, this, of the sanctuary building to go down there, and in the chest there are a whole slew of these. Pick one up, carry it to them, and say, I am praying for you. We are praying for you. Because when we're praying for each other, it is truly a special gift that we give. The band U2 is one of my favorite bands, and they've got a song out of their Joshua Tree album that I love so much. The title of that song is, I Still Haven't Found What I'm Looking For, and it chronicles someone's search for meaning in life, for purpose, that they are trying, they're just looking for something more to life than what they are wandering through. See, I think there are people in our community and people around us that are doing that as well. They're searching for meaning, for purpose, for community. What I really think they're searching for is, I think they're searching for a relationship with God. They're searching for belonging. Maybe you know who that person is. Maybe you know someone in your life that's doing it. They're struggling to find grace, struggling to find meaning, struggling to find forgiveness or love. 
Have you prayed for them that they would find that one thing you know, that relationship with God? Have you prayed for them that they would realize that God loves, for, loves them, cares for them, and that God is waiting with arms wide open to say, welcome home, and that there is a place at my table for you? Every once in a while, I have someone come into my office and they say, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know what to do. I'm praying for my adult child. They're lost in the world. They seem to be lost. I know what they need is they need that relationship with God in this house they grew up in. They need to be back with God again. What do I do? I say, keep praying for that. Keep praying that their heart will be open, that they will realize that God is standing there with the door open waiting on them. Keep praying for that. But the good news is that our God in heaven plays the long game in life. God is playing the long game with society ever since creation. God has played the long game with you and with me, waiting for us to say, you are my God and I am your child. And it will do the same thing with yours. All we can do is keep praying for that person who still hasn't found what they're looking for. We keep praying for them and lifting their name up. God will open their eyes at the right time. See, when we pray for them, it's truly a special gift. See, prayer is that specific action. It's a thing that you and I do. It's the utterances of our hearts, and it is, as the president said, a special gift. It costs nothing from us but our time, our focus, and the willingness of our spirit. But here's what I believe, and here's what we know. We know that prayer can change the world around us. It can make our world a better place for all of us to live in. It can make our world a better place, and it can alleviate pain and suffering. Prayer can bring about reconciliation and a healing in a way that only God understands. And if we believe that here in this place, then let us live that outside this place. If we believe that we can make a difference in the world in our prayers, then let's start today. As a matter of fact, let's start right now. So here's what I want to invite you to do. I want to invite you to pray with me. I will start the prayer and I will give you space to name those things that are on your heart. And let's begin changing the world right now. So pray with me. Oh God, we are your children. We are your followers. We believe that you can move mountains, that you can divide oceans, that you can deliver your children from captivity to freedom. So we pray to you this day. We pray for the people of this congregation. We pray for those who suffer or are in trouble. We pray for the concerns and issues in our community. We pray for the world, for its people and its leaders. We 
We pray for the church universal, its leaders, its members, and its mission. We pray for the communion of saints, the wisdom that they have shared with us, and the charge they have left us with. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. So we started just now, but it's not over. I ask you to join me this week in praying that prayer every day. Whether you pray first thing in the morning or in the middle of the day or at the end of the day, I challenge you and ask you to join me in that prayer every day this week. And let's open our eyes and see the difference our prayers make. The difference the prayers of a thousand of us make in our world this week. Because that's the gift that truly keeps giving to the world. Amen and amen. Friends, having been reminded of the transformative power of prayer, let us take a moment to sit and rest with these words. May we pray. Almighty God, by your grace, keep us in constant conversation with you through all of our prayers. And may the exchange and the conversation that we have change the world. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. As our ushers come now to receive our tithes and our offerings, might we be mindful that just as prayer changes the world, so does the generosity of God's people. So might we share with generous and grateful hearts this morning as we give back to God out of what God has so graciously given to us.
May we pray together. Receive these gifts, O Lord. May they be magnified by your Holy Spirit to teach your children about your love, to show the world your grace. May they bring healing to the brokenhearted, to comfort the grieving, to embrace the needy, and to praise your name. We offer ourselves as instruments of your peace to the world, we offer our talents, our time, and our gifts to you. Use us as you will. Deploy us for your benevolence. Transform our hearts as we transform the world. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. You may be seated. Friends, this morning we continue to celebrate God's grace and God's goodness as we receive new members into the church family here at Centenary. So allow me to introduce to you our new family members. This is Bryant and Tanya Johnson. They come by reaffirmation of faith. And they also have Preston this morning who is almost a year and a half. It looks like he might be a little sleepy or shy. Either way, I was shy as a kid and I came out of my shell. Eventually it does happen. Glenn has a couple of questions to ask you this morning. So as members of Christ Universal Church, we be loyal to the United Methodist Church and do all in your power to strengthen its ministries. If so, say I will. And as members of this congregation, will you faithfully participate in its ministries by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, and your service? If so, say I will. And to you, my brothers and sisters, we welcome this new family. And so I commend them to you to your love and care, do all in your power to increase their faith, confirm their hope, and to perfect them in God's love. And so we respond together. We give thanks for all that God has already given you, and we welcome you in Christian love. As members together with you in the body of Christ and in this congregation of the United Methodist Church, we renew our covenant faithfully to participate in the ministries of the church by our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. 
that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. Amen. They will be in the narthex following the worship service with Glenn, so we hope that you will stop by and officially welcome them into the family here at Centenary. We are so grateful that you all are making your church home here with us, and uh, it is our hope and prayer that the God of all grace will continue to bless you with grace upon grace so that you will continue to grow in your love for God and love for neighbor. Welcome to Centenary. Thank you. So as you go out into the world, don't forget your homework. If you know someone that would benefit from a prayer shawl, they're right up here. If you are intrigued in learning more about this, there is always room for one more in their circle of folks to knit and to pray. Talk with Jeremy or myself afterwards and we will get you connected with them. But also on your way out the door, we've got Worship in the Park in a few weeks. We've got these cards that tell all about Worship in the Park. I encourage you to pick one up, give it to a friend or a neighbor, a coworker that you have always wanted to invite to Centenary and to come be a part of what we're doing. And invite them to join us for Worship in the Park. It's a great gateway to bring them into our fellowship. So as we go forth, let us go forth in prayer for the world, for its leaders, for society, so that all may know the goodness of Christ. Amen and amen.
Thank you once again for joining us for worship this morning. We hope that during the last hour that you have experienced the risen Christ through song, word, and prayer. We hope that it's enriched your life so that as you go forth this week and the days to come, that you will take the lessons and the things that you've learned and sung and heard here and are able to carry them forth, enrich your relationship with God and your service to all of humankind. Blessings.